Okay, in this video, I'm going to speak at great length, <laughs> if I'm honest, about drafting equipment and some of the equipment that comes in your kit, as well as some of the equipment that you could go get yourself if you wanted to kind of have some more options, um, particularly if you are a student who is maybe thinking about going into engineering or architecture, or maybe at the end of this course, you decide, yes, this is definitely a career that I want to pursue. You're going to have to get some supplies yourself, so I want to show you some of the options. Um, but to start off with options, the first thing that we would need for doing drawings would be paper. Um, so there is paper in your drafting kit. It's not regular printer paper. It's slightly larger. So regular printer paper is eight and a half inches by 11 inches. Let's see, I've, I know I've got some of that sitting around somewhere in here. And so we can just kind of see it compared size wise. So this is a piece of regular printer paper. Let me make sure it's on the screen. And we can see that the paper that comes in your kit is just slightly larger. So this piece of paper is letter paper and it's eight and a half by 11 versus the paper that's in your kit is architectural size A paper, and it's nine inches by 12 inches. So all of the drawings that we're gonna be doing by hand will be using this paper, this architectural size A, just cause it gives us a little bit more room and the numbers are a little easier to work with. There is lots of different sizes of paper that you can have for drawings. So a size A is nine by 12, and then if you have two sheets together, so you can then get a sheet of paper that's the size of two of these combined, which would be size B, and it is 12 by 18. And then you could even get four of those together to make a size C. So then we can make a piece of paper that's even larger than that, that I can't even fit on my screen. And that would then make a size C, which is, 18 by 24 and then even past that you have architectural size b or excuse me d which is 36 by 24 so it's a three foot by two foot and then it goes all the way up to the largest size which is a size e which is um three foot by four foot so it's a very large sheet of paper and you need to think, well, if I'm doing architectural drawings, I'm drawing large scale objects. So I need to have bigger sheets of paper to fit them on. We're still gonna shrink them down onto the page, but we need bigger sheets to put them on the paper. So that's why we'll have those different sizes. The paper that's also in your kit, it's just a little thicker of a bond. So the paper is just a little bit thicker, a little sturdier than like a typical piece of printer paper. But there's also then different options out there for when we may need them, such as tracing paper. So tracing paper you can buy in sheets or you can buy rolls of it. And what tracing paper allows us to do is trace over something. So there's a little design here that some kid was working on on this roll and then just kind of put it back without finishing it. But we can kind of see that with tracing paper I can put something underneath it and I'll be able to see it or trace over it. So if I was working on a drawing of a house and I needed to kind of transfer it over onto a new sheet of paper because maybe something was getting changed, rather than restarting the entire thing from scratch and having to put all of those details and everything in, I can just use tracing paper to trace over it. I prefer buying rolls of tracing paper rather than sheets just because I find it a little bit easier to work with and I can make them different sizes. Um, and also tracing paper will come in two different colors. So you can have the white color like this, or I personally prefer yellow tracing paper. And my personal reason for why it may be silly, but it's just because I like how it's already kind of this dirty tinged color because then I feel less bad about maybe like making mistakes on it. Um, Cause tracing paper is usually how I just work out little problems. Um, it's not what I would do any finalized drawings on. Another good thing you can do with a roll of tracing paper 
is you can get your aggression out and you can smash it on the side of a desk to make it so that it's no longer like a perfect roll, a perfect circle. And that way it won't roll away on you when you're drawing with it. Um, and then the last kind of major type of paper that's used is vellum. And so vellum, this is a sheet of architectural D size paper, so it's not even going to fit on the desk or under the camera, rather. But what we can kind of see is it has that same quality that the tracing paper has, so it's still see-through. However, it is now it's made out of plastic, but it used to be made out of sheepskin. And it has this really nice smooth finish to it, so it's a nice high quality kind of alternative to tracing paper. Um, I can trace whatever I need on it. I can actually run this through a printer or a plotter um, and work through it um, and print directly on it from the computer, but it's kind of just a higher quality option compared to tracing paper. So this I might use for like a finished drawing or a final version of a drawing versus the tracing paper, which it can just wrinkle and get a little bit messed up kind of easily. Now, on those pieces of paper, we need utensils to draw with. And so the, in your drafting kit, you have some pencils. You have some just regular pencils that you're probably familiar with. I hopefully don't have to tell you, you know, that that it right there is a pencil. But then you also have some spe special pencils in your kit as well. And they have little designations on the top saying that they are H pencils. So we have an H, a 2H, and a 4H in your drafting kit. So that is referring to the type of pencil that it is. So your regular Ticonderoga pencil is a number two HB pencil. Um, so a lot of times, maybe when you're taking tests, they'll say, you know, oh, you need a number two pencil. And most students don't know what that kind of means. Well, we're about to know, find out what that means. So whether or not a pencil is an H pencil, a B pencil, that is referring to if it is a hard pencil or a black pencil or a soft one. So I have here some of my pencils that are already sharpened, just because I don't want to go through and sharpen a bunch, that have various kind of types to them. So this is an H pencil. So we can see here that it says that this is a 7H. So you don't have a pencil that goes up to that number, but you do have H pencils in your kit. And what that means is that it's a, considered a hard lead. So hard lead pencils have less clay in them, which makes them harder for the pencil itself or the lead to break off. And because of that, it will leave a lighter line on the page. So if I go to draw a line, it's gonna leave a very light line on that page, which will then be very good for guide work in my drawing. So I can put guidelines down and erase them very easily without having to apply a lot of pressure because it's gonna leave a lighter line. The higher number that H is, the lighter the line will be. So this right here was a 7H versus, I believe this one's a four, let me just check. Da, 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 da. So this one is a 2H on it. I know it's a little hard to see with the light. So that's a 7H versus a 2H. I get a much darker line out of it, but it's still considered an H pencil. So it's still a hard lead. And then if I have just a regular number two pencil, we're starting to then kind of approach lines that are similar. So a regular number two pencil is kind of right smack in the middle of an H pencil and a B pencil. So hard pencils are good for guideline work, work for lines that we want to be very light and easy to erase. And then on the opposite side of that spectrum are B pencils. So B stands for black. And what that means is that there's more clay in the lead and it'll be harder 
or rather easier to break off and it'll leave a darker line. And then that number of course is going to affect how dark it is. So this is actually, I believe in number nine, it got scratched off, but I'm pretty sure it's a number nine B. And with the same amount of pressure, I can get kind of a darker line coming out of it. So with B pencils, I get darker lines coming out of them because they break off easier. They're softer versions of pencils. So B equals black. And then let, let me write it with this one, actually. H, I'll put it. And right now I'm using a lot of pressure so that this way you can actually see me writing in the H pencil. pencil. But H equals hard. So you'll get lighter lines. B is black you get darker lines. There's also then options for like just pure graphite pencils. So that's what this is. So rather than this having like that wooden casing for the point itself, the entire thing is. So this way I can get thicker lines coming out of it and I can also use it to kind of shade areas and kind of break parts off if I need to. Then even more so, one of my personal favorite brands of pencils are these ones here. It's by a company called Blackwing. They make fantastic pencils and you can get H pencils or B pencils from them. The thing I like about them is this, or one of my favorite things about them is this little eraser top where you could take the eraser off and you can extend it or you can replace it. Um, in the field of drafting, we erase quite a lot. And so it's very helpful to have an eraser that you can then continue to use because I almost always use the eraser up on my pencils before anything else on a pencil. And you'll notice a lot of drafting pencils, so those, these three that come in your kit, they don't come with an eraser at all. And the eraser is actually just a separate piece that will go over because of course there are different types of erasers that exist in the world too. Um, now, just for some other pencils, too, that we're going to look at real quick. You don't have them in your kit at all, but I told you guys, I love pencils. I love pens. A lot of times, too, for guideline work in my drawings, instead of maybe using an H pencil, I might use, like, a color variant because then... For me personally, I like looking at different colors to kind of tell the difference between um, what's a guideline and what's my actual work. These pencils I like a lot for guideline work because they're two different colors. So it has a blue tip and a red tip. So that way I can kind of maybe do my guidelines in red and then finish out my drawing lines in blue. Or I can just kind of make notations on things with a pencil like this and maybe put like encouraging notes in blue and then maybe kind of things that need to get fixed in red. A pencil that's commonly used for guideline work in like very finalized detailed drawings is something like this one. So this is called a non-photo blue pencil and it's going to be difficult to see on the screen because that's its intent but it's a very light blue pencil and it's made to make very, very light guidelines that when run through a, like a photocopier or a scanner to be put on a computer, this particular color blue does not get picked up by scanners and photocopiers. So I can have this underneath my drawing outlining every single little thing in the drawing. And for me in person, I can see the little, the poorly drawn square that I just made just fine. But for you guys on the screen, it's very difficult to see because that's the intention is that it doesn't get picked up by like videos and scanners and things like that. So with something like this, I can leave all of my guideline work on the page itself and not have to worry about erasing any of it because when I go to scan it in for a final drawing, none, nothing that I do in this pencil is going to get picked up. So I'll put all my guide work in and then I can take another pencil and trace over whatever I have 
and not have to worry about erasing any guides or things like that. This right here is um, a water soluble pencil. So this could be used for doing some shading stuff in which I can put down some of my pencil marks and then I can take a brush and I can do any size brush depending on exactly what I'm doing. And if I have some water on that brush, which I don't think I have any water around. I got some Coca-Cola around, but I don't exactly want to dip it in Coca-Cola. There we go. And so with some water on my paintbrush, I can move it and shift it and use it to kind of shade things. And so it is graphite, but it's in meant to get wet and be, um, and be used almost as like a little bit of a paint in drawings. And then I could even go through and layer that in if I wanted to some more. So that's water soluble lead. And I guess kind of the last thing would then be things like this. So this is a lead holder. And so if I press down on the top, it's just got a big chunky piece of lead in there. This would be used if I was like on a work site and I needed to kind of make notes or maybe do a drawing on something that isn't quite like even or just like a regular piece of paper. I can use this to kind of write things out or make marks or notations. Um, and it just, I press down on those jaws and the lead can come out. And then if I wanted to put the lead away, I just press down on the jaws again and I can just hide it away in there. The thing that's really cool about lead holders too is that almost all of them, if you unscrew the cap, there's like a little pencil sharpener in the cap. So you can see all the little dust coming out. And so I can just kind of sharpen it on the go, which is nice and neat. And speaking of sharpening on the go, in your drafting kit, you have probably my least favorite method of sharpening a pencil, but it technically can get the job done. I just really don't like it. And I don't even know where I put mine on this desk here, covered in all of this stuff. But there is a little booklet of sandpaper. Where did it go? I lost it, kids. It's okay. I'll just get another one. So you've got this little pad of sandpaper. And this is used to kind of help keep your lead pointed. So one thing that we discuss in this module is that our line weight is important. So whether lines are medium or thick or thin, we want to try to keep consistent line weight. And this is pretty much just used to sand your pencil point to keep it a consistent line weight. It's always a good idea if you're using this to kind of rotate it around as you go. So that way your pencil gets pointed on all sides rather than just on one. Personally, I just would rather use a regular pencil sharpener than something like this, because this can take a long time, particularly if you are genuinely trying to sharpen the entire pencil from being very dull but it does work. I mostly just use it to file my nails, if I'm honest. Then, to piggyback off of pencils, we've got erasers, different types of erasers. So in your kit, you most likely have a vinyl eraser, which is a plastic one. So vinyl erasers are very good. They're not my personal preference, but they're good erasers. They tend to be able to erase pretty deep lines without having to use a lot of pressure. And they tend to leave a minimal amount of like dust on the paper itself. I'm not a huge fan because I do think that they can be a little too harsh on the page and start to rip up some of those fibers on the paper which makes it um, sometimes can potentially even put like a little hole in your drawing. But vinyl erasers are very good, definitely an option. Personally, 
and this is another vinyl one too just a little dirty I personally like rubber erasers so rubber erasers are much softer um, they can smudge things a little easier they do leave a lot more debris on the page and they maybe don't get harder lines off as easily than say a vinyl one but I personally just like them because they're a little bit softer on your page and don't necessarily rip holes through them and I don't know it's just it's just personal preference though you can also get just like erasers so this is an eraser stick where it's just instead of having like a pen it's just like a clicky pen but with a little eraser in it let me just push that back in there um, so this way I can maybe get into kind of smaller areas if I need to. And you could even have, which I used to have, but some students broke it on me, unfortunately, but they have um, electric erasers too. So that way you can kind of get into small areas and get a lot of precise details when it comes to erasing. And even potentially get up pen because since the eraser head is spinning around inside of the electric eraser you can get lots of little crevices out um, it's pretty much just like having a dremel or a drill with an eraser head in it and they're really cool and I loved them and then my student darn broke it on me uh, and then last thing a couple of things about erasing I don't want to bore you too much with erasers but you're enjoying my eraser spiel, my 20 minute long eraser pen spiel. Fantastic. Um, is in your kit you have a little flimsy piece of metal here that's got like some punches and things in it. Maybe, should I turn this lamp off to make it easier to see? Probably. There we go. That'll be good. There, show up. That's very bright. There we go. It's adjusting. It's adjusting. Um, but this right here is an eraser shield and so the eraser shield is meant to protect parts of your drawing as you go so that this way if you do have to get into kind of a fine area to erase you can kind of protect the other parts of your drawing so that you don't accidentally erase them. The part that we move, use most often in the eraser shield is this little dotted line in the middle because that can help us make hidden lines in our drawing. So what you'll learn in this module is that hidden lines are, let me use a different pencil. I'm just gonna make a straight line here. Whoop. And I did that kind of dark, but I just more because I want to make sure it's visible. Hidden lines are used to show kind of edges that can't be seen in a particular view. And they are a series of consistent short dashes. So what we do with our eraser shield is we take it, line it on top of a solid line, hold it in place, and then go to town with our eraser. And then when we remove the eraser shield, we have those even short dash lines without having to go and draw each one individually. They're evenly spaced. They're the correct size for our drawing. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, and it takes less effort thanks to this fun guy. Now, if I was using technical pens for my drawing or markering my drawing, um, and I maybe made an uh-oh or a boo-boo, that would be really not fun because pen and marker are very difficult to erase. And that's why some drafters, myself included, like to have a white pen in their drafting kit. And this is just a white gel pen. And really its purpose is that I can just go and mark over little areas of anything that I did and kind of erase in those smaller areas because it is just a white pen. A lot of times if I am using a white pen, I'll have a sheet of paper kind of somewhere off to the side 
because the little ball tip in this gel pen will pick up some of the ink or pencil that's left on the sheet and then it'll start to kind of drag it and make those ugly little smudges that maybe I don't want but I can use this to kind of cover up some areas. I can also have paint pens or acrylic pens. This is a red one. Oh no, this is a white one. I thought this one was red. But it's kind of like having a white out pen a little bit where I can go and white things out. I guess this one must be my red one. Yeah, that one's my red one. It's a little dried out right now because I haven't used it in a while. But we can have a paint pen around to mark out areas that we might have made some boo-boos or accidents in. And those are our different type of pencils and how we can erase our pencil marks. Additionally, you may want to use pens for your stuff. Now, personally, I don't use technical pens a lot, but I do like to use markers for drawings. And what I've gotten into recently a lot, and I'll put that camera, whoa, that washed that out real fast. There we go. Um, but I've gotten into recently a lot of these Sharpie pens. So they're just really thin, but they leave Sharpie marks on everything. I find them to be great. You can get them in different colors. And then my favorite pens that I have are these ones. They're called twin markers. I buy them online. Um, my dad gets them for me every year for my birthday because they're just my favorite pens because they have a thick point and then a little tiny point. So I can get thick lines and thin lines out of this one same marker pen. So I can get a thick line or a thinner one out of the same pen. I get those varying line weights and I don't have to have like a lot of different tools with me. Don't think that I carry every single thing that I'm, I'm showing you today. I don't have all of that like in my one drafting bag. That'd be ridiculous. Um, but these are fantastic pens for kind of finishing up a drawing and that way I can kind of put maybe emphasis on an outline of something and then kind of thinner lines. Love these fellas. They also come in different colors. And then if I was really finishing off a drawing, making it really, really fancy, I'd want to marker it. And so there's different types of markers out there. There's water soluble markers, which are kind of just the Crayola markers that you are probably familiar with. And then there's alcohol markers, which are what these would be. And so this is just to kind of show you just like some of them. Da, 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 da. Um, there's a few main brands out there. There's Prismacolor, Chart Pack, and Copic. Um, Prismacolor would probably be out of these three would be the cheapest and then Chart Pack and then Copic. But alcohol based markers are still very expensive. One of the kind of pros for them though is that you can, I don't know with Prismacolors if I'm honest actually, but I know with chart packs and with Copic markers, you can refill them with ink. So while the pen can be expensive, so for example, like one of these will run about four or $3 per pen, which is, or per marker, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, you can refill it and then the refill ink is a little bit cheaper um, so if you're someone who does a lot of heavily marker drawing, um, then these are the way to go, particularly because they're also layerable. And so that means I can go and put some pen ink down and then I can put ink more on top of it, more on top of it, more on top of it. And I could get like a darker color and then have it kind of maybe fade into a lighter version. Um, I buy, when I get Copics, I get the Copic Chows because they are cheaper than the other ones. Um, but it has this little brush tip where I can get a thin line or a thicker line out of it. And then it has this chisel tip as well for drawings. 
And the chart pack markers typically only come with a, which one of these has the wrong cap on? This guy has the wrong cap, which means some kid, some kid switched my caps on me. There we go. <laughs> so chart packs only have a chisel tip or a fine point. It's only one or the other on it. Um, but they also are alcohol based and they are layerable. And a lot of times the most valuable marker that you can have for a marker set are the different grays, because then I could take this blue color and then based on what gray color I lay over it, I can then kind of change it a little bit. So rather than having to buy every shade of blue out there I can buy this one blue and I can kind of layer it into different colors and different versions. The drawback of alcohol markers besides the price is also that they bleed a lot. So even when I put down a line on a regular sheet of paper it's going to kind of start to bleed a little bit and if I'm trying to just fill in an area that can be not so great Eventually, or personally, you kind of do going to get a feel of how much that marker ink is going to bleed out, and you just kind of adjust where you're putting it. Um, but you can also buy specialized paper for markers that'll stop it from bleeding all too much. Um, but again... That's maybe if you're just someone who's really into making technical drawings and renderings and things like that. Any other pens or pencil types before I want to move on? Hmm. I'm looking at my table. I don't think so. I think I think that's, that's enough. And see, the markers, too, they bleed through pages a lot, so never want to have something valuable underneath a drawing. Because otherwise, you're going to get marker all over it. So then on to some of the more stuff that's in your kit. So in your kit, you have a ruler. Ruler has inches on it. It's got centimeters on it. Hopefully we know how to measure and how to read things. Most rulers are broken down into sixteenths of an inch. So that means every one of these little markies on here is one sixteenth of an inch. So then that's one sixteenth, one eighth, three sixteenths, one quarter, five sixteenths, three eighths, uh, seven sixteenths, a half, so on and so on and so on. Um, and then centimeters are broken down into millimeters, and each one of those marks is one millimeter, and there's 10 millimeters in a centimeter. And then there are 25.4, or is it 24.5? I always forget. Oh no. Um, there are 25.4 centimeters, or millimeters, excuse me, in one inch, if you ever need to do a conversion of it. But I always just type that in online to do a conversion of it, because I never trust myself to make sure I'm doing those correctly. Now, we're just going to use a regular ruler for all of our drawings, because I don't want to get into using some of the more complicated tools, plus it's not in your kit. But if you were to take, um, come to the school and take drafting to architecture, you'd be faced with this guy. This is what's called an architect's scale. So scales are, they work like rulers, but they also work a little bit differently. So there is this one side here that is just a plain ruler. Um, but what we can see on each edge is, and let me put that brightness down so we can actually see or is it the cat the light thing again now it's very dark wow um, but there are the different numbers 
on the edges. Whoa, well, I was just blinded. So this says three, and what that means is like three inches equals a foot. So that means that on a sheet of paper, every three inches would be a foot. Or for instance, if I turn it this way, and now it says a quarter, that means a quarter of an inch equals a foot. So that means every quarter of an inch is marked out here. So from zero to here is one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot, five, six, seven, eight. And so we use this for architectural drawings to scale them down or to shrink them proportionally because we want to make sure that we can fit our drawing onto a sheet of paper. Even if it's a larger sheet of paper, we still need it scaled down or shrunk. So we're not going to go into detail in this course about how to use a scale or how to read a scale, but just to let you know that they do exist. And you can get them in different materials. Plastic is the easiest to find and it's the cheapest, but you can get metal ones too if you'd be interested in them. But we're just going to stick to our regular old ruler because it's a little more comfy to use. Then, along with our drafting kit, you also are going to have these two little guys here. So these are called set squares, even though, yes, you're correct, they are triangles. They look like triangles. If I asked you what shape is this, you'd say a triangle, and you'd be correct. However, they are technically set squares. And the way I like to describe that to students is just because in drafting, we like to have fancy names for everything. So this way we can feel superior to others. So that's why, you know, like we don't call, we wouldn't call this a ruler. No, we call it a scale. And that's why we don't call these triangles. We call them set squares. But personally, you're going to hear me call them triangles quite a bit because they are triangles if I'm looking at them. But the reason we call them that is they help keep things square. So we use our set square in tandem with our T-square. So your T-square is going to look just slightly different than mine, and that's okay. Sorry, it's going to get washed out again as I move the light back into frame. So yours looks just a little bit different than mine. It has that detachable and retachable top which I'm going to go get one so that this way I can show you how to untach and detach it. So one minute while I pause the video. Well, it won't be one minute for you, but... Okay, so your T-square comes in this little pouch and it has the body of it and then the head. And so that just makes it a little easier to transport around and then to put it together You'll put the head underneath and then slide that piece, that little keystone piece, into it. And there you have it. Your T square is put together. So, the purpose of the T square is it works in tandem with your drafting board, which your drafting board also looks a little bit different than mine. But that's just because it's hard to see the white paper against a white board. So that's why I use a wood one. But the T-square hooks on to the side of the board and we use it to draw horizontal lines that are going to be parallel to each other. So what I would do is I would first line my paper up underneath a T-square. So whenever I start any technical drawing, I always am going to take my T-square and line it up underneath my page so that way the edge of the paper is nice and flat. Then my next step of every drawing I ever do is I'm going to tape my paper down. Now you may have these in your kit. Those are called drafting dots and they're just kind of pre-done pieces of tape. Or you may have a roll of masking tape or painter's tape. Your tape could be green, it could be white, it could be blue, it could be any color. But these are just tape for to tape down the edges of our page. 
Now we tape our paper down so that this way we can use our tools around our page rather than um, trying to keep everything parallel and perpendicular. So it's always very important to tape our paper down. Personally, I think these are a waste of money to buy drafting dots. Drafting dots can be pretty expensive and I just find them a little bit wasteful versus I could buy a roll of masking tape for pretty cheap, get a lot of uses out of it, also be able to use it for anything else that I might need masking tape for. Um, and it's just cheaper. The reason why some of you might have these is when we bought drafting kits for you to take home, they came automatically with drafting dots. And if we have them, we might as well use them. But personally, I wouldn't go buy these. And I wouldn't recommend you do either if you're ever in a situation to do so. So with my paper underneath my T-square nice and straight, I would take some tape, rip it into some pieces, and tape the edges down. The reason why we use masking tape is so that this way, when we go peel it off our drawing, you don't rip our paper, because that would just be so sad to do. Now, as I draw, I can just move my T-square up and down, draw a line, draw a line, draw a line, and all of my lines are going to remain parallel. So they're always going to be the same distance apart as I draw them. And I don't have to worry about, you know, my page accidentally moving underneath it. Now, if I wanted to draw lines that were vertical, I would use my set squares. So yours, you have like little blue ones in your kit. The one that I'll often use is this guy. I like him because he has a handle, which makes it easy for me with my nails to pick up. And you have a 45 triangle and a 3060. And that's just referring to the angle that it has. So here, I'll even show you with the one you have in your kit. So the 45 triangle, can do an angle of 45 degrees and it can also do 90 and the 30 60 triangle can do a 60 degree angle or if I lay it that way it could do a 30 degree angle and it can also do a 90 but I always am going to use these in tandem with the t-square and whenever I'm using the t-square I always want to make sure that I'm kind of pushing it against the board. So whenever I'm using my T-square, I'm kind of just pulling it with my hands or with my fingers a little bit against the board to just make sure that it's staying flat. Because if I have my T-square just hanging out like that, even if I think it's straight, it's still not guaranteed to be straight or to keep my lines parallel. So whenever I have my T-square, I'm always just yanking it against the side of the board a little bit. You're going to hear me say that a lot in videos, and I'm going to say it a lot because it's important that you remember it. Same thing with your triangle. You, when you're using your triangles, you're kind of going to be taking your triangle and pinching it against the T-square. So while I'm pushing my T-square against the board this way, I'm also going to be taking my triangle and pushing it down against the T-square. So I've got part of my hand, I usually just am using my thumb to just kind of lightly apply some pressure just to make sure it's staying flat. And then with my other finger, I'm just kind of lightly pinching it onto that T-square. And then I can move it around if I need to, to draw different angles. I can even take both of these triangles and use them together to draw any variant angle of 15 degrees. So I can draw 15, and then if maybe I wanted to draw an angle in that direction, I could do lots of different variants using these together, or I could use them separately. We mostly just will use them separately. If I wanted to get super fancy, 
I don't think I have one up here, but you can even buy an adjustable triangle where you can set it to any amount of degrees that you want to. But really all you need for drafting is you're just gonna need the 45 and the 30. We use this one a lot when we're doing what's called orthographic drawings. And we'll use this one a lot for what's called an isometric. We'll go over those in more detail in some of the later modules. But these always get used with the T-square so that this way I can make sure that all of my lines are vertical and then they're also perpendicular to those horizontal lines that I used to draw with this. So whenever we're using our tools, we always have our paper taped down and we're always making sure that everything's nice and flat and flush. It does take some time to get used to and get familiar with. Um, one thing that I'll notice from some students is that they kind of express some frustration using the tools because they see me using it and I can do it fast and easily. And what I have to let you know is that I've been using these tools for a very long time. And that's kind of the reason why it's fast and easy for me to use them because I've been doing it for a very long time. And as you practice something, you, you improve on it. So the more practice you do, the better you will get. You are not gonna be perfect at it the very first time around and that's okay. That's okay. Um, you can get these also in various types, shapes, sizes. You can get little tiny baby ones if you want. I, so I like, I have these kind of in my little travel drafting kit. Or you can get giant triangles. You can get ones with handles on them like I have. But if you're just taking the, this, this class just to see what drafting's like, then you've already got two of them in your kit. Now to just move on to some of the other stuff in your kit, because I've been rambling on because I talk about pens and pencils for a long time. Oh wow, 47 minutes in, woohoo. Um, so in your kit too, you have a ellipse guide. And so you might also, I can't remember if I put circle templates in them or not, but you might have a circle template in there. This helps make circles. Um, but if you don't have one, then you don't. But then you'll definitely have an ellipse guide and we can see on it that it says that it's an isometric ellipse guide. And what it, this is used for is to make circles in what's called an isometric, which is a 3D style view. So we use these to make different circles there are different sizes and they're labeled based on the diameter of it. So this is a circle that is two inches in diameter, but if I was drawing it in a three-dimensional isometric view, I would do it with an ellipse. And when we get to drawing isometrics, I'll go over how to use this in a bit more detail. You also have a protractor in or rather a compass, excuse me, you do have a protractor, but you have a compass in your kit and this is used to help make circles or half circles. Um, what you do with a compass is you figure out what size circle you need to make, you take a ruler, you hold it up to the edge of the ruler, and now I would have a circle that has a radius of two or so on and so forth. Um, then you stick the pointy side in and you can make curves and such or full-on circles. We'll also go over in this module how you can use a compass to create or just to kind of almost as a measuring tool. So we can use it to split things or take different measurements on our drawings and equipment. Compasses are pretty nifty, pretty handy tools. You'll have a protractor in your kit. Uh, personally, I do not think we're ever going to use the protractor, but you'll have one in there, and I guess you can use it if you so choose. And then additionally in your kit, you'll have a lettering guide. 
So the purpose of a lettering guide, and here's just one, I don't want to open up that bag yet, but I already have this one here open, is this will help make guidelines for when you are lettering. And in this module, we'll go over what lettering is, but lettering is nice, neat, all caps handwriting. And the lettering guide is to help kind of give us almost put like lines on the page, just like if we were using a sheet of loose leaf to put our words in. And so what you would do is you'd take this guy, pinch him on to the T-square while you're pushing the T-square against the board. So always making sure our T-square is flat against the board and we're holding it flat against the board. And then we can put our pencil point in the tips here and just kind of lay out guidelines almost as if I was making my own loose leaf to put my drawings in. Typically I would do those guides extremely light, but I don't think it will show up on the screen if I do them as light as I would want. You can kind of see them so we would do it very very light so that that way when I go to write whatever I need to write in there I've got kind of a nice guide to make sure that all of my words are going to be ending at the same spot and starting at the same spot um, but there's an entire little lesson and practice related to lettering so I don't want to do all of that right now right today and with that the other thing I keep in my drafting kit is a, a packet of instant coffee, but I don't, that sh shouldn't be in your kit. Um, other than that, yeah, there are lots of different drafting tools out there um, that you could get, but this is definitely what's in your kit and some of the tools that you could use for writing and things. Believe it or not, even though this video is 52 minutes long, I've actually shortened my lecture about pencils quite significantly. I actually used to go over the history of pencils and how pencils are manufactured, but I decided to take that out for you guys. Um, so that's just some of the tools in your kit and how you'll use them, how you'll work with them, and in the rest of this module and in module four and five you'll get to practice using them quite a lot.